Spartans to Podcast Evolve, your favorite Halo podcast. I am your host today, David, and today we have another very special episode for you. We are joined by Krista. Hello. Aaron. Hi, guys. Oren. Hey, everyone. And very special guest, we have Craig Bear, who is the author of the Forerunner Saga, which you probably already know, Krypton, Primordium, and Silentium. But also, we are joined by a super special guest, Chloe Bear, who, along with her father, wrote Halo Rebirth, which I had totally forgotten about. Um, sorry about that. So it's like the, se- the secret one that you guys did, um, and you did like an unusual way of release. So I want to say it's not all my fault, but it is probably all my fault. <laughs> it was hidden in the trade paperback of the tour edition. Well, there was yeah. like a download code for it that would take you to. Did you read the the, the text of it for the audio version? Uh, I, I yeah, I read I read the uh, out loud read the text for it in their studio, so. <laughs> Chloe wrote it and I read it and they put it into the audio version and there's some stories about that too but let's ask them later. Absolutely. Um, so guys again, thank you very much for joining us. Uh, we know you're all the way from Seattle which seems convenient given the fact that it's <laughs> over they make Halo. So that's got to be cool. Yeah, yeah, we would go over there and take a look at their studios but they it was such an amazing operation they wouldn't let me take a picture of it though because it was all <laughs> proprietary and top secret. It's like being in a defense department. They only let me on the ground floor when I went up. <laughs> yeah, same. The ele- elevators were off limits. <laughs> <laughs> there were Spartans guarding the door. <laughs> but also, they, they, when they were doing the, the, the game, they allowed me to watch some of the voice actors doing their voices in studio, uh, uh, putting basically some of the scenes in the novel to life. And that was great fun. So I almost like being on a movie set. That is actually pretty cool. I, I think I remember seeing a quote of them saying that how they recorded Halo 4 was not like the other games. So it was the first one where they had actors together interacting and stuff like that. So that was probably worth seeing. Kind of like a, a regular movie, although they did not have CGI green screens. I don't think they <laughs> screens they might have I, I i don't know quite all the things they use to bring some of the characters to life but they certainly use the voices and um, so i was going to do a little bit of general chit chat about the pair of you especially because when i started looking into both of you there are some things that cropped up i was like holy crap you keep that very quiet very to yourself and um, so first off i know oren is similar to yourself we both grew up like a Navy, I think, Orin, your dad is in the Army, or is it Navy? I'm not sure. But you both traveled around as kids, and, like, I think landed up in the same places. Am I right in assuming, Orin? Uh Well, yeah, so my, my father was in the Marine Corps. He uh, he flew and actually still does fly C-130 aircrafts. Um, now he's retired. Um, and so we've uh, moved around all across the U.S. and lived in Japan and Indonesia overseas. Um, but um, where are some of the places that, that you've lived? Well... I came back to San Diego area when I was 12, uh, but before that, we had been in uh, Texas, Rhode Island, the Philippines, uh, all sorts of places, as my father was a meteorologist. We, we met up with a lot of Marines. I don't know if we met with your dad. When was he in service? Um, he was in service relatively recently, um, the nine, 99 or no, 1990 to about 2015, around there. He he hit like 22 years. And I don't think the math quite added up there, but <laughs> it's okay. We don't worry about numbers. <laughs> 1966. He got, he got off the carrier of the Oriskany, which is worth looking up if you want to watch it on YouTube. Uh, there's all kinds of history on the Oriskany, but he got off the carrier just before they had a major disaster on it. And, oh my and gosh! Yeah, so so uh, he was retired at that point, and uh, and yet we still had a lot of a lot of activities to go to for the Navy to help support people and everything. So it was it was very interesting. I picked up my understanding of some of the Marine Corps attitudes and some of the Navy and military attitudes, which I put into the uh, the trilogy that I wrote. A War Dogs trilogy. Then I had uh, some of my friends who were in the military take a look at that and make sure I was getting it right. And I think I remembered enough that it kind of worked. Anyway, it was also put into the, the Halo uh, books uh, in, in a sidewise way, kind, kind of an overall scrim, so to speak, uh, on what was going on with Bornsteller and everything. Meanwhile, Chloe was my expert on all of this, and so I, I referred to her when I needed to find out stuff. And then I would go to the 343 people and, uh, and and they would confirm, and, and they give me amazing freedom up until the very last book. And we can tell a story about that. Oh, definitely. Um, before we go too far into Halo, one other thing that definitely caught my eye is that you were one of the original. Now, there's different facts around, so I'm going to say you're one of the five that started San Diego, uh, 
San Diego Comic Con. I'm not sure. Remember, it sounds probably more like seven or so. Eight, five of us in one high school were part of the original committee. That's amazing. We were at a school called Crawford, which is still there and, and a major kind of big school. In 1968, we all got together and uh, Scott Shaw, David Clark, uh, John Pound, uh, Roger Freeman, and me. And we were all friends and, and kind of met each other in different junior high schools and ended up at Crawford, uh, most of us. And then we went on to become big comic book fans and science fiction fans and going to the Worldcon in, in Claremont Hotel in the San Francisco area in 1968. And after that, there was Comic-Con. So uh, Comic-Con started about 1970. That's awesome. And so I... I think every nerd around the world, it's like, that's the one they want someday, pie in the sky, I want to get there. Um, I did the one in Dublin, which is on a way smaller scale, but um, I imagine, Krista Orton, I don't know if you, either of you have gone to the San Diego one, have you? No, it's really hard to actually get tickets for it sometimes. Sometimes it I imagine sells, sells out of just basic tickets in the first couple only hours. we knew someone on the committee who perhaps... <laughs> hmm. I think that would be taking advantage of our uh, <laughs> of our position, of David. Back because it's the 50th anniversary, so wow. we are uh, they are going to be uh, celebrating us, uh, those that. of us who are around, and uh, we're going to be. Uh, I don't know how many panels we're doing. You know, Comic Con kind of runs on its own, and and long after we left or stopped being key to the committee, the committee ran itself very very well and suddenly acquired people. Uh, that, that were just really top notch at running major organizations, and so, so we could tell many stories about that. But I don't know whether you want to deviate from Halo or. We won't go too far, just because I know how, how how much we want to talk about everything else. So I will say, Aaron, I know you were interested, and it did catch my you. You illustrated and even wrote some Star Trek comics, or it was a, it was a book when it was. I, I wrote a Star Trek book called Corona. That's exactly it. And that was back in 83 that I wrote that. And I was working on my first computer. And I says, okay, I'll write a Star Trek novel so I can learn how to write on this computer. And, uh, and I did. And, and uh, it was, it was uh, pretty well received. Uh, it, in a weird way, I've ended up writing in nearly every major franchise except for Richie Rich. I never wrote one of those novels. So. <laughs> you did a Jurassic Park comic, too. So. Yeah, yeah. Chloe and I uh, put together. Yeah, I've I seen that, that, too. You seem to have a finger in a lot of franchises and are quite comfortable um moving in and out well you know if we go back to my star wars novel i was a star wars fan and raised our kids in the star wars universe and uh you mean you raised them properly yes we did <laughs> they were quite fundamental in that area uh, just just as i was a i, I forget the correct phrase as a trucker or a trekkie back in the 60s uh i became a star wars fan when we first saw the film and i wrote about it for the los angeles times uh, back in 77, just after it came out. And that article turned out to be fairly influential uh, because I was talking about science fiction in relation to movies. And I did that for the LA Times for about four years thereafter, and that was great fun. Yeah, we're just a huge family of nerds, basically, so we're into everything. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> awesome. We're, that's it. We're, we're in the grand family of nerds here, so it's, that's our overall clade. Yeah, my dad pretty much did the same thing, where he was a big Trekkie and... My, a lot of my old youngest memories is watching Star Trek with him. So that's kind of where it began for me too. So I, Aaron, I think you're a big tracky even still. Yeah, I think it's something similar. I think the next generation started the year I was born. So it was still like live on TV. Because I remember being like maybe five or six and my dad sitting me down and going like, you're going to watch this, you're going to enjoy it. And like some of it might have <laughs> gone over my head, but <laughs> I'm, uh, I'm still a big Star Trek fan these days. Forced into the fandom. Yes, we were we were never a Star Wars household. I didn't get to that until I was almost an adult, so it uh, it doesn't have quite the same appeal to me. But I'll always go back to Star Trek. Chloe, when do you remember first seeing Star Trek? Oh, I don't know. Probably the movies, because uh, I don't know. We never watched the TV shows, and I always thought Star Trek was kind of boring, except for the movies. <laughs> <laughs> I will say my, my exposure to Star Trek was also the films, um, but my parents did watch Next Generation, but I, I never really uh, invested into into the series. No, I always remember it being a weird trend in the UK that you always got Star Trek movies on at Christmas. It was the strangest sort of... <laughs> that is a wonderful Christmas. Yeah. Spaceships are great ornaments, I gotta say. You probably sell them as models. <laughs> Hang them on your tree. Exactly. Um, so I know we touched a little bit quickly on chloe you did a jurassic park comics so 
What was that like? Where I wrote most of the script and he got half the credit, but I got all the money anyway. Oh, that's all it <laughs> is. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I'm happy to share credit, but but uh, hand over all the money. She did the, all the oh, hard work. Yeah. And, and the, uh, the whole um, script process was pretty amazing because Chloe nailed it. She, yeah. Those scripts were changed very, very little between the time uh, she wrote them and the time we handled them in. I'm yeah, the- a lifelong like, comic book reader and Jurassic Park fans. This worked out very well for me. Oh, and I think uh, Jurassic World actually kind of swiped some of my ideas about oh, the no. Raptors. We were both clearly thinking in the same direction. Yeah. I don't think I actually read my comic. <laughs> I want Raptors are cool. They, they own everything. You, you, you work for them and it's work for hire. And the studio owns everything. That's true. It's theirs and never yours. But I suppose your name is, will always be associated with it. So I suppose that's something. You know, it's, it, they're fun to watch. The movies, I've actually enjoyed watching some of the later movies. The first one, of course, was major. And I, yeah. I had an insight into that, as did Chloe back when she was quite a young, young thing. Uh, we woke her up one time as we were visiting the tippet shop about uh, 1988 or so. And she woke up to this rather cramped studio, which was where Phil Tippett was at that time. And uh, she woke up to a giant red scorpion, <laughs> which was going to be repaired and replaced on the set of Honey, I Shrunk the Kids. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I don't know if you remember all of that. But, oh, no. But then we, uh, we hung out. I, I, I've been friends with Phil since we were teenagers and watched the process of how he was going to be doing Jurassic Park as stop motion. And then watch the the rather abrupt transition to computer graphics, which was caught everybody by shock and surprise. Yes, yeah, this is Phil Tippett, one of the special effects guys. He did like the animation in uh, Empire Strikes Back and stuff too. Yeah. Oh, so all the practical effects. Very good. Yeah, that's awesome. And just while we're on the topic of uh, comics, Chloe, have you read the Halo comics? Just out of curiosity. Um, I read some of them a long time ago. I kind of got out of reading Halo stuff, so I haven't been caught up lately. I think I just read the anthology comic that had, like, the Mobius book and yeah. all their stuff. Yeah, yeah. Well, they're kind of hit and miss. I was just kind of curious. Like, they, they kind of range between good and not so good. Comics in general. So. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah, that's true. That's true. Also, it's kind of like an inside joke um, between especially myself and Aaron about nanotech. And what caught my eye is that you're credited, uh, Greg, as being the first person to ever write about nanotechnology. In your novel, Blood Music? Yeah, Blood Music was uh, biological nanotech. It was soft and squishy rather than silicon-based. Uh, Eric Drexler was the master, the man who created nanotechnology. He's a science fiction reader. Uh, and we met him several times, many times, and uh, quite impressed by his work on engines of creation. But Blood Music came out before engines of creation. Ah, so you won. Kind of laid people's ideas about what nanotechnology could actually do. And it turns out, of course, that we are nanotechnological engines. Proteins are, are some very small machines. So that was that was in Blood Music, which was great fun to research and write. Again, we just said in the way we joke, because um, especially in Halo 4, that was the, around the time, which is interesting, uh, given your ties to that game, where Halo started talking about nanotech and using it as a way of a get-out-of-jail-free card of why something could happen. It was like, oh, because nanotechnology allowed it to happen. And everyone was like, oh, great. Yeah, it's that wonderful magic wand that you can wave over a sci-fi universe and something will happen. It's now being taken up by all the Marvel movies, you know, nanotech oh, on totally. the internet suit and everything else. That's It's oh, yeah. just magic, right? You can do what you needed to do. So going again onto the games, Chloe, I'm imagining you're the gamer of the family, given that some of the previous kind of quotes and stuff had had Greg saying you were very influential in showing him this universe in Halo. Oh, I mean, my sister plays lots of games too. I'm the first person shooter fan of the family, like definitely. Like, I played Halo. I used to have LAN parties back in high school when the Xbox came out. So, playing Halo for a really long time. Awesome. You're one of those cool kids who got one of those LAN parties. <laughs> oh, yeah. Used well, to sit in the basement and hook up, like, two Xboxes with, uh, <laughs> what, Ethernet cables and have two TVs in two separate rooms so we couldn't look at each other's screens, you know. Oh, I'm glad you said two because LAN parties in my head, especially in America, are, like, halls of people and just bodies. And when I used to play games we could barely get four people together so i did have two xboxes connected and did exactly what you did 
So I, I'm glad now that I can think that I had a LAN party once. <laughs> no, you did. I I was on the same level as well. Yeah. I think you got through all the games. Didn't oh, you? yeah. I also used to be... I'm still pretty good at multiplayer every time I pick it up. It's kind of like riding a bicycle. All the skills are still there. And I just don't know how to shoot stuff. That's excellent because I suck, but I love them. Um, so you're fully caught up then? You're up at Halo 5 and everything? Uh, Yeah, I didn't play any of the side games, but all the mainline games. Uh, that's, they had they had a brief foray into like tablet games and stuff and shooters. I think Aaron likes them. I never really... Like is a strong word, David. Like is a strong... You played it. You played them both, didn't you? I did play both the iPad games, but... um, Meh. The less said about them, the better. Not important additions to the Halo canon? No, they did not bring much to the table. <laughs> so... Greg, I also noticed that you are credited as being a consultant, especially on on, on a range of different things that are fascinating. Um, but just to stay focused on where we are, you are credited as being an advisor to Microsoft, specifically the game Xbox division. Was that, I imagine, was that Halo 4 or was there other things that you were consulted on? No, it was it was a project that never quite got off the ground. Oh, was okay. Involving space elevator type operations. And it oh. was fascinating to work with these guys because... Some of the games they had worked on, I was a big fan of. Yeah, I think it was the same. Some of the same people that worked on Crimson Skies, if I recall correctly, yeah, which yeah. was a oh, new yeah. classic Xbox game. Yes, it was. It was an amazing Xbox game. I think it was the first thing I ever played on Xbox Live. I think it was on like a you know like a demo booth in a store. It was cool. It was space elevators. That's cool. Just kind of we had some meetings and then uh, that's right. Chloe meetings. was there too. She 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 had some of her first meetings were on that, and she backed me up. On, uh, on my knowledge of games there. So, Chloe, did you just, like, tag along and get access to all this amazing stuff way before maybe you should have? <laughs> I got story input, though, so I got to leave my mark on the Halo universe. Dude, that 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 is amazing. When we had our first breakfast with the 343 guys, we were walking around outside waiting to get into this a pretty nice breakfast restaurant in Seattle. And, and Chloe looks at me and says, you're human. Uh, you, you, your forerunner needs a human sidekick. And we went in and pitched it to Frank, and, and, and Frank says, no, I'm not sure that would work. And then suddenly his eyes lit up and he says, wait, I know who that human becomes. <laughs> Just like that. <laughs> yeah, so that human sidekick character became 343 Guilty Spark. Yeah. He's <gasps> yeah. one of my favorite Halo characters, so I'm glad I could like uh, bring him oh all. Oh my god, I love you so much. None of these guys like... Guilty Spark, and I'm just like, why? Uh, so good. He's adorable. Well, we weren't sure. Uh, uh, Chloe certainly wasn't sure that that was where it was going, but certainly the forerunner needed a human sidekick, and that kind of established the entire arc of the novels. Yeah, and I also got to force them to wrap up a bunch of dialogue, a bunch of Guilty Spark's dialogue from Halo 1 from the library, where you're just oh, walking around amazing. being serious. Yeah. <laughs> so I made them resolve all that stuff. <laughs> Even though he kind of after like thousands of years of just. Yep you know, being by himself. And so it's all really distorted, but he does actually resolve all the stuff back in his human days and back in his, like, early shell days that he did in the in the first Halo game. So what was very cool is the the whole personality stretch and everything kind of becomes like an Ibsen play. You know, the, it's... it's uh, it really was fun working in this universe and, and allowing all of these massive characters, the, uh, the two didacts and all that stuff, to come and go in their evolution. And also just to, to lay out the uh, the forerunners and their culture, but also the precursors, and uh, there were many stories to be told about that. But but to be given the freedom to mess around in this massive universe was great, great fun for me and for Chloe as well. Well, you just got to make up stuff out of whole cloth because this That's was right. all like uncharted territory. We had to, you know, we had to hit some points on the board there where you have things that are in the games, uh, you know, some dialogue and so on. Uh, uh, and and we got to match that, but it wasn't too hard. And and these guys, uh, the three four three folks, were very very uh, tolerant. I I sent a note off saying, "Is it okay if we do this?" I said, "Yeah, that, that could work." And, <laughs> and we just move on. However, when it came to the third volume, they were working on the game. And as they're working on the game, and we're approaching the end of the third volume, I'm hoping to have the freedom in the last few chapters to do what I want to do. And they said, no, 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 we're, we're, if we allow you to have that freedom, we'll have to change the game because it's already locked in. And at that point, the publisher really wasn't quite understanding what's going on. And I tried to explain that. It's like working on a movie. You know, you, you, 
They will allow the writer to be creative in the beginning, but when the script is locked in, you don't want the writer to be endlessly creative. Yeah, once they got the models built, you know. Yeah, and, <laughs> and the actors and all that stuff. And once they are paid for it and, and doing all the CGI, uh, that's probably, I don't know how much it costs. How much do you think it costs? Way too much. About one hundred fifty dollars <laughs> is my guess for what a game costs like that. Uh, to put it together, that's uh, just a crude guess. I don't have any ex- ins- inside information there at all. But if it's $150 million, they're not going to want me to mess around with it. Sure enough. I mean, okay, we've been dancing around it a bit, so let's just dive in. You guys got together and had access to this amazing franchise. So where did it begin? I know you touched on there was been talks and discussions. So was it... Because I found two or kind of things based on different kind of interviews and stuff you'd given in the past. So... I don't want to hold you to things you said like six or seven years ago and ask you to remember them. But um, were you approached and asked to do a story or did that come, Did it go the other way around? Was the Chloe push you in knowing that you were a writer, <laughs> that you would like this franchise? They, they approached me and uh, apparently uh, some of the 343 people had read a novel I wrote called City at the End of Time. And uh, what I hear is that after they read that book, they says, I think this guy could do the Halo stories, the Forerunner thing, which was kind of perilous because not only was Microsoft taking over, uh, but the uh, uh, the game was coming up and they had to figure this was going to be their first big game. So playing around this way is kind of courageous or foolish, I'm not sure which. But uh, <laughs> they, that's when they brought us in for meetings and uh, we started realizing eh, this could be fun. And Chloe and I attended that first breakfast, and then we got to go out to the studio. Did you ever go out to the studio? Uh, yeah, a couple times. Yeah, and and to see what they were doing, and and uh, you know, I get together for for uh, luncheons and all that kind of stuff. And uh, we met a lot of the people involved, and they were very impressive. And it really was like working on a major motion picture. That's so cool. And Chloe, I imagine it was totally. I got amazing. to see like sneak preview Halo Four stuff in progress. Like, <laughs> you know, and- <laughs> tell anybody yeah we couldn't tell anybody you know so so the books had to be our 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 event to to get out to the to the audience there and i gotta say meeting the halo fans was also astonishing they were energetic they were young quite often and they were very enthusiastic and uh and as we we promoted the books we started meeting people who kept showing up with different levels of enthusiasm and i'd remember them from one emerald city comic-con to another and, uh, and and as we're signing books, I point up and say, "I know you. You're so and so." And and they just they just light up with the enthusiasm. They just love these games, and they love meeting the people who are helping create them. So yeah, that that sounds nuts. Just to be able to come in and, like you said, you had that level of freedom. And it was obviously they had the idea that they wanted a forerunner trilogy. Was it a tr- always a trilogy they had in their yeah, heads? Yeah, it was contracted as a trilogy and. You know, that, that third book, I, I had the freedom up for the first half, and then suddenly they locked me down. So I had to learn how to do that. It's like being on a scripting mission, you know. You have to take what we've got and put it back into the book. And I said, oh, okay, well, I can do that. I've done scripts. All oh, right, so it came back at you. That's interesting. Because I was going to ask, because I noticed the dates, the, the books were 2011, 2012, 2013. And in the middle there was Halo 4, was, I think, scheduled. Yeah, they were already working by the time we started writing. So they just kind of started incorporating stuff we put in the books, into the game. We would oh, so share, cool. share material with them and characters. And what I find particularly amazing is uh, the Didact character, which was only lightly touched on in the original Halo uh, stories. I suddenly realized I could have great fun because we didn't have a physical description of the Didact. Well, what we call in the in the final book, the Ur Didact, the original Didact. Uh, one of our characters, spoiler alert here, becomes <laughs> another version of the Didact as he matures. And that's the, the ISO didact. Yes, we need to thank you for breaking brains all across the Halo universe. As for even today, we need to explain to each other which didact it was. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But in the, in the Halo 4, it was the Ur didact who was really cutting loose and, and, and coming back and really wrecking havoc. And that was a fascinating thing to watch my character, as I describe it in the book, being given life, animation and, and voice and all that stuff. It was great fun. Yeah, then you got to shoot him. <laughs> yeah. You got to, quote unquote, kill him. That's awesome. I didn't realize that it was that much of a give and take or back and forward, I suppose, uh, between you and the, and the team. And the Ur Didact and Ice Didact is one of the, like, well, the Ur Didact is like one of the most interesting and definitely one of the best kind of um, antagonists to any game we've kind of had. Um, so I imagine that was awesome to see that come to life. 
and have a voice actor who was amazing and has some amazing quotes and dialogue and stuff. Were you involved in any of the dialogue for the game? Uh, some of it was uh, actually taken from my novel, and, and I watched uh, some of the voice actors actually reading the passage that would be uh, between the life worker and the didact. Yeah, they had all the cutscenes from the terminals in Halo 4, if I recall correctly, that were drawn from your books. Yeah. The Lord of Admirals and yeah. Pride, all that. Right. That was and great to see. Watching watching them put that together, again, it was it was like watching a movie being made. Had you ever had any experience with like that before? Was this their one and only kind of foray to this kind of work? I had a, a Twilight Zone uh, episode done in 85 based on one of my short stories called The Dead, Dead Run. Oh, excellent. I got to go up to L.A. My friend Alan Brennert was a story editor on Twilight Zone, and he picked up on the story and, and got it into production. And I was able to go up there and watch uh, them putting the set together and actors and and uh, Steve Railsback and and uh, other great actors watching them get ready for to film the scenes and so on and, and got up to some of the uh, location shooting and that was great fun. But also we got to uh, watch the construction of hell on a soundstage. <laughs> hell was like an apartment complex, you know, so it was quite something. I think that was also, if not Brent Spiner's like first yeah. screen role, one of his first screen roles. Yeah, he like shows, very up, briefly. shows up in the back of a truck. Oh, that was Brent Spiner. That's awesome. Yeah. I guess talking about different franchises and stuff. So what I kind of wanted to ask you, and I hadn't got a chance to ask any other authors before I had a chance to meet. You've written, obviously, in other franchises and have written sci-fi for many years before you came along and, and got a chance at Halo. I wanted to ask, what did that look like when you came? And you've obviously been very well known for what you do, and then you're given something that's pre-established. How did that compare? What did you make of the Halo universe when it was given to you? Well, uh, it's classic science fiction, so I fell, fell right into it. It was something you know that I had been reading since I was a teenager, uh, lots, lots of these books. I remember reading uh, about Ringworlds way back when with Larry Niven's novels, and uh, and just uh, okay, I get to mess with the Ringworld. That'll be fun. Um, the, the interesting thing is, I hear that there are there are other uh, Halo uh, products that are using uh, books and so on that are using storylines based on my books, and that's cool. When I wrote a Star Wars book turned out without my knowledge that 17 other books used the world I created for uh, my Star Wars <laughs> Rogue Planet. The Rogue Planet was used in 17 later, I think 17 Yeah, they later. ended up being how they beat the Yuzhan Vong, I think. Yeah. So. <laughs> and now that's all not canon anymore. Yes, it's all gone. So, so I created all these extra novels and it's not canon anymore. But you know, they could they could do well by bringing some of that plot line back. Yeah, actually, now that you mentioned it, I did get a chance to talk to one or two other writers who had the same experience you did, where they created a book and then had it erased. Um, how did you feel about that? Did you mind? Did it? There's nothing I control about it. I mean, yeah. I, I wrote a good book and it's been read by people, and they still go back. A lot of people still go exactly. back. Read. The non canonical so, books and enjoy them just you know just as much if not more. That's I mean the whole blue about it was almost like they weren't going out and taking the book away from you and burning it. You know it's still a good book. It still exists. It's many many copies out there. In fact, that's how I ruined my autograph was signing all those Star Wars books. <laughs> you ruined it. Yeah, there was going going to uh, and again the fans, the kids, the the uh, young readers, but also the older readers are amazing in these franchises. They just love these books and you got to get you got you got to give them honor and credit here that they are among the most enthusiastic and sometimes the most knowledgeable and i think of the groups that i dealt with the halo fans are still among the most knowledgeable and the most enthusiastic and what astonished me about what chloe and i had put together is they approved of it and this was such a relief when we started getting back halo cyclopedia comments and, and questions and so on and a lot of fans oh would, i'm sure you were berated and 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 I did not hear a negative word, but I, I wasn't looking for it either. So, <laughs> But really, they accepted it, and it became part of canon almost immediately. As soon as the first book came out, suddenly it was part of Halo canon. And I was getting asked questions up until, you know, a few months ago. Uh, well, do you remember what goes on here? And, and I, it's like they're trying to <laughs> score points with their social group. And I don't remember it anymore. I'm not the one to go to. Uh, we don't remember either, so it's fine. That's why we're constantly going back to the different websites and reminding each other stuff. Um, that's why we create these groups. They're like support groups, just to remind yourselves of different bits. Um, so I did want to ask, you've kind of touched on it already, but um, your piece of the Halo universe is truly unique. Now, other authors have gone back and kind of continued, but your trilogy, as it were, or maybe I'm going to count Rebirth as well. So all those four pieces of fiction are like, 
totally set apart and unique compared to like every other kind of book and Halo and stuff like that. What was it like? Obviously, you were going in with the origins and I'm kind of asking kind of Chloe this more so because she would have been familiar with the games and the story before you were doing any of this. What was it kind of like being told you get to do everything from the start? You get to create everything, you get to do the origins and even the crazy origins of humanity was amazing seeing that happen so what was that like like this is all the this is all the deep backstory stuff that i think every halo fan was waiting for yes so i don't know i like being a part of that and like finally getting to actually you know answer all those questions that i had as a halo fan playing halo one for the first time back in the day a lot of halo fans at least according to what we've heard uh really kind of wanted that reserve for their own playground and uh, they came up with the theories and came up with sketches and designs for the forerunners and everything, which were looking kind of elfin in their in their conceptions. And so when we transformed that, turned it upside down and kind of bulked them out, there was a little concern, 343, that we had all these fans who were really critical at times. And, and suddenly they were on our side. It was a miracle. It was just a miracle of enthusiasm and love and... and uh, the characterizations fell into place, and suddenly uh, the, the game started to take shape. Number four started to really come alive in its own history, background and history. That is something, the excellent point that I didn't really realize at the time, and I think everyone kind of knows of it now in terms of like in the Halo circles, that when I played the game, I didn't know about your books. Well, I knew of them, but I, I don't think I'd, I'd ever read them. And I read the trilogy after I read Halo 4 and went back to play Halo 4. And I don't think there's been a situation like this before where your books make that game so much more better. And obviously it shows from the way that they were written and obviously you were writing it together and there was work collaboration going on. And everyone knows now that you read that trilogy before you go in because it sets up these characters, these amazing characters in the game so much better. Obviously a game can't do everything. Um, but the books are obviously hundreds of pages long of well, you backstory gotta credit, and lore. Gotta credit the game makers there because they. No, no, you get the credit. You get, you get the credit. I appreciate the credit there, but you know we got to talk about three four three and the whole studio and everybody involved was very supportive. But they really knew how to do this. I mean, they were experts at what they did, and and watching that organization get its work done and produce a really lovely product is is was astonishing. And obviously, getting Chloe, you got the you got your. You got your bits in, in involved as well, and that that's cool. That's definitely going to be cool. No, did you wrote that? You did that. And one little short story there. What we hear and what I've seen is apparently there's a new publisher for these books, so they're coming out in substantially similar but different publishing editions, and so the books continue. I mean, they're they're going on, and I guess they're not out of canon now. No, not at all. And that's what I would one of the later questions going to say is that your stories have become more relevant even today than okay, they were always relevant back then, but when they go quiet and you know the games move on and stuff and time goes on the 343 still go back to your books your stories and they're still introducing new pieces and links to it so like every it's not surprising at all that that it's getting is it a reprint is it a, I don't, i'm not sure about um if it's a new publisher or how, how that kind of works but i'm not surprised at all it looks substantially the same same covers and everything but uh, they're coming out of simon and schuster now oh that's right yeah no the books would be so i guess when you came into the the franchise and you got a list i mean the Halo Bible is known as like a, is a thing. And like, <laughs> wow, when you got access to kind of all this information, all that kind of stuff, was there anything that stood out to you? Something that you maybe didn't like about the franchise or the way that they had maybe designed a piece of technology that didn't make sense? Was anything, did anything stand out to you really? No, uh, I don't recall being offended by their science fiction ideas because yeah. they were classic science fiction readers. They, they kind of knew how to make this uh, military SF game. Uh, read like science fiction and and uh, or play like science fiction and there's some stuff you know in terms of uh, scale and uh, anti gravity and all that stuff which you could quibble with but but that's pretty true of nearly all the, the media adaptations but what they were doing was they they uh, created a, a universe a world that players love to play in. And to do that with the technology and everything introduced a lot of people to science fictional ideas they might not have encountered otherwise. And they did it with a fair amount of sophistication, so I have no complaints. I kind of wanted to ask as well, you introduced the, um, I'm going to mess up their name, but they're called the Prophets in the game. And they're Sans and Hume. They're like the other race that were kind of allies with humans at one stage when they're fighting the war. But I thought that very fascinating because they were like the enemies in the actual games and their ancient form was a partnership with uh, with ancient humanity so i i really liked that um that kind of introduction and was very surprised to see them appear um as like in their ancient form 
thought that was a very nice touch. I had uh, great fun with the precursors too, of which almost yes. was known. And I, I look back to a cover art that, that I had seen when I was a teenager based for a, on a John Brunner book that, that I took that cover, uh, which I believe was an Emshwiller cover, and looked at this monstrous creature being dragged on a palanquin over hundreds of human bodies as he's you know radiating his psychic energy. And I said, oh, my God, how is that not the precursor? Yeah, I think the original <laughs> description for the, the trap precursor was that it was Totoro with a sea scorpion for a head. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I, had to, I had to provide sketches to the, to the artists uh, for them to figure that out. And uh, I'm not sure how much they actually used it, but it was really fun. And going back to that cover art, and Emshwiller and Brunner is, is, uh, the, is his novel is called The Atlantic Abomination, and I think fans should look that up and, and possibly read it. And that would get settled the precursor, uh, the precursor imagery in your head was from this novel. Yeah, I, I reduced the size a little bit, but uh, the story is about a an alien being found at the bottom of a giant trench, uh, and brought up, uh, and and it, it's got psychic powers. It's still alive and. You know, the, the origin of, of uh, the didact and the cryptum was also from another uh, project. It was from Thea von Harbaugh and Fritz Long's story, The Indian Prince. Or no, The Indian Tomb. The Indian Tomb was about a fellow who's going to become a kind of a superhero who is self-mummified through meditation and is pulled up out of the ground and revived over a long period of time and becomes this psychic super powerhouse it's a silent movie from 1919 i think or 1920 and it's well worth watching it's an incredible book. but that's kind of where i pulled the idea for the didact and the cryptum and his coming in and out of uh, of, of history at that point is i kind of thought okay this is pretty cool so that's an old silent movie that influences me as well so your influences come from all over when you're desperate you take where you can <laughs> <laughs> you steal stuff yeah, you take it, and but you also give credit. And as I think the one thing about uh, the Halo universe is there's a lot of credit to be passed around. It's not only is, yeah. in the middle of science fiction culture, and it dominates in some cases, but it's really it's, it's pretty cool. I was going to ask about the Halo 4, but you've kind of already really touched already, mostly upon um, you're great at this. You answered all the questions before I even got a chance to ask them. But some of the... Um, you're some of those characters and some of the places you go there's some real big standouts the precursor planet where that was found um shuram Harkor, that was an awesome mentally difficult thing to conceive of um that's that was so cool i mean i loved that setup and that i mean people go back to these books and these descriptions even today to kind of try and wrap when they're talking about things happening now to kind of get their head around it i mean there's some great sections that are always worth going back to Thank you. i just thought that was amazing and the same with them um, mithrilian the uh, former home um the center of their government it's kind of like it's not really a planet i guess it's a big space station i guess is what i'm gonna call it's an artificial it. construct yeah there we go yeah i've that, always loved artificial constructs i don't know if you saw them there was a book that came out a year or two called uh, halo mythos that had like it was like a start and finish of the halo timeline and it covered a lot of your stuff and we also, for the first time, got to see a lot of those things conceptualized in art and actually in print. We got to look that up. I haven't seen that. It's definitely worth, worth looking at. It's just a, one standalone kind of art book that gives a lot of descriptions, but it shows these kind of concepts and what the Mithrilian actually looked like. And that was great for me because my simple brain um, couldn't really comprehend <laughs> some of the things. I'm on a page with David. I think your novels were the first time I had to sit down and like scour the internet and go, I have absolutely no idea what this looks like. My brain just doesn't function that way. And I was just like hunting around looking for drawings and sketches going like, oh, okay, that makes sense. It's just in my head. I think the way I always described your novels in the Halo universe is yours feel like a uh, proper grown-up sci-fi. And I feel like the rest of the time, I'm just reading about the soldiers shooting each other. And uh, it's something I've always enjoyed about them. That's very difficult for the writers to put together is to create you know, compelling novels out of what amounts to first person shooters. And I got to give credit to my my uh, uh, friends, the writers here for for managing that for so many years. And, and uh, I got to say that the freedom I was given is kind of contrary to what they had to face, which was to fit into character arcs and so on. And, and, uh, and 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 make it all work and make it a, a good story. So going back to, I, I was Eric Nyland one of the first? Uh, yeah, he wrote The Fall of Reach. That was the first novel. Yeah, and, and the, you know, the work that they had to go through uh, allows me to do what I did. Well, that's definitely something I want to ask in the same way Aaron says, 
your style of writing is completely different, obviously, than anything else that we had had coming up to that. And even since, it's, it's quite a unique. You have a certain, your own style, and certainly a sense of scale that is unlike anything. So I think Halo is was always like that, where you were obviously the small first-person guy on this massive ring world, and your books introduce a scale greater than that again over what it we were used to it as a player in the game. Something that I always, I did struggle with, uh, definitely with the, because I don't think I'd written, or sorry, I hadn't read any sci-fi like this before. And it was definitely something uh, I struggled with. So were you at all worried with um what that was like, knowing that your style was very different? I know you were approached deliberately because of how you write, but were you at all worried with how that would be received, that the readers of the books, like the reader base, as it were, would be used to something very different? I wasn't the one taking the risk. I, I <laughs> feel true very reassured that these guys trusted me or at least gave me some faith. I don't know whether they drank a lot uh, off hours or not, but, uh, but they were really helpful and, and, and giving me that sense of freedom, as I say, until the game got going. You know, what you have to do is, I think if you want to go back to their mindset, you want to take a look at some of my other books, like Eon or City at the End of Time. And City at the End of Time is a very strange book set 100 trillion years in the future. I've often thought, as I look at the Halo universe, that it's kind of part of the uh, Foundation universe in some respects. No, I'm sorry. It was a Star Wars universe that always seemed to be part of the Foundation universe, some part of of, you know, of Isaac Asimov's vast quadrillion population in, in the galaxy, 100 billion stars and so on, that, that, that the whole Star Wars saga could be encompassed in that, because Star Wars to me seemed like a lot like a Foundation story. But when I wrote the Halo books, not only was I allowed to play with Larry Nevin's Ring Worlds and, and Ian Banks's Ring Worlds, uh, but to go in to the limitations they had made and just have fun, you know, to think, okay, I wanna I wanna push a moon through a ring world. What'll happen if you do that? <laughs> That's one of my favorite scenes. Yeah. And it, it, and you think about it in terms of the way, you know, um, gravity works and engineering and so on and Ah, that's that's fun to imagine. And was that difficult to conceptualize when you came up with these grand ideas, like these huge astronomical bodies interacting with each other? Well, it's no more difficult than writing about characters. So, <laughs> you know, characters are as complicated in a, in a story as anything in the landscape. When you put them on a, a landscape like this, uh, that affects the way they're characterized. And that's one of the typical things you have to do when writing science fiction is adjust your characters to the worlds they occupy. Not just the worlds, but the cultures and the languages and all that sort of stuff. And, and that, that's great fun, but it's also not easy. And to trust someone to do this with your baby has got to be kind of a, a, a rough go at times. I'm sure it got easier with the books released and the reception and stuff that uh, helped build momentum. Yeah, I think they were breathing a sigh of relief by the time number two was acceptable. <laughs> and, and then when number three came out and seemed to be acceptable, and that's, you know, part of that fits into the game. That was a great sigh of relief. But we are still dealing with 100,000 years before. And that's an excellent segue into your characters. So you have some obviously truly unique moments and unique characters that you've created. Did you have one that was the most fun to write or the most challenging? Or in Stellar, because he goes through a, uh, goes through a yes. transition to become a mature forerunner. And to think of the transitions between different kinds of forerunners, male and female and and the males and, and the society that you, the families you would have and the extended families, uh, that was not easy. But also, it wasn't in, impossible because in, in the novel Eon, I was dealing with a far future world with similar cultures, uh, different uh, family structures, and, and different shapes of, of beings uh, in a high tech world. You could be what you wanted to be. If you wanted to be completely artificial or male or female or whatever, you could change that. And so they addressed each other as ser, S-E-R, rather than, than uh, the, the, the sexual pronouns. And uh, they, that, that kind of prepared me. That bent my brain back in 1984, 85, uh, to get in shape for what was going on with other science fiction novels. And I wrote a couple of sequels, which explored backwards and forwards from Eon. When I wrote City at the End of Time, it was even stranger because we're dealing with a universe that is so very 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 old that the laws of physics are starting to fall apart and uh, the, the weirdness beyond the city of the landscape it comes to me I was influenced by William Hope Hodgson and the Nightland and I just kind of wanted to expand that and take his impulse and 
And Hodgson was an amazing writer. He was uh, an Irish writer who wrote stories like The House on the Borderland, uh, which is one of my favorites to this day, and then very difficult books like The Nightland, which is quite quite a substantial piece of visionary writing. He died in World War One. He was killed at Ypres in a battle in France. And so, you know, if we take a look at the origin stories for these fantasy things, you can run back and forth. And I'm going to get off on the track here unless you pull me back in. But No, you keep going. You're doing great. Tolkien was in World War One. That influenced, I think, he, he may not have agreed, but I think that influenced his vision of Mordor. Is the, the searchlight and all that stuff kind of reminds us of being in the trenches in World War I. Uh, and and well, there's a movie out now. I haven't seen it yet, but I'm looking forward to seeing it. The new one, yeah, that looks quite interesting. Yeah. Sen, on the other hand, predated World War I with The Nightland. He anticipated the trenches with The Nightland. And The Nightland, if you read uh, his Nightland itself, is kind of a, a precursor to Mordor, but also to what they saw in the trenches at World War I. And uh, it's it's chilling. It's utterly terrifying. And, and to go with that and and play with it was another privilege because his stories are not only Lovecraftian but kind of Stapledonian. And I wonder, in fact, if Tolkien had read before he went into the war, if he had read The Nightland. Those things that you're the way you just listen to you speak for the last 20 minutes is great to see all these influences. And I can see them. I can I mean, you're they're there to see the way that you've placed these characters and these um, these situations. I did want to ask about the ISO and Eurodidact, where he came from, but you've kind of really touched on that already, that I've seen, that's probably one of the most unique character arcs, I think, ever, to see two of the same character essentially be created and that be different at the same time, and their stories and where they go is, is fascinating. Well, creating confusion among the readers is one way to avoid criticism. But, <laughs> but in fact, the uh, the ISO didact is imprinted by the Eurodidact, and so that's why he's going to grow up to become a kind of a, a, a mockery of the Erdidac. Chloe, were you involved in any of these crazy shenanigans? Did uh, he consult you and say... That, that was all him. That was all <laughs> him. He takes all the blame, does he? Yeah, I take the blame. But I did I did run it past her, and I ran it past 343 folks, and, and uh, so they approved, and they were either crazy or brilliant. I'm not sure which. They, it worked out in the end, so we can say brilliant. Um, the pair of you. So, Chloe and Krista... This is now your time to shine because we have to talk about 343 Guilty Sprague. I know you touched the button on the start, but this character and Chakos, the connection, the link, the where it goes and how relevant it is right now is, um, is awesome. Go, Krista, go. Yeah, so uh, I'm not sure if you guys are familiar with Halo Renegades that just came out. Slight spoilers. Uh, but that really builds on kind of the universe. It, it actually builds directly on kind of how things ended up at the end of Silentium and Rebirth, so it's kind of interesting to see that. And it's in modern times, it's like 2559, so it's 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 very strange. Sounds like they're having fun with it, though, that's cool. Yeah, yeah, but um, going through Primordium, it was just... The, the moment you find out who Chakas is is something that is quite dear to my heart. Um <laughs> Uh, well, we got we got to blame the three four three people and Frank. Yeah. In I think that was Frankie's brainchild. Was hey, what if we make him into three four three? And I was like, yes, go for it. That was right there in the first <laughs> minutes of the breakfast. You know, we pitched we pitched the notion of a, of a human sidekick, and suddenly Frank was on it, and he did that, and that was what kind of, as I say, structured the entire series. Because three four three is such a strange, out of place character through the games, it really cemented his place in the universe, at least for me and a lot of fans. So it was really interesting to kind of see his progression through the series, and if also he he complimented Born Stellar in such an interesting way, like. Him and um him and Riser and Bornsteller and especially in Cryptum, it was such an interesting trio to kind of learn from and kind of delve into the universe. Well, I had fun doing it because I was able to play off my anthropological uh, stuff, uh, and and uh, anthropology has really become interesting in the last. It's always been interesting, but especially interesting in the last forty years. And when you see the creation of the mix of different species. I was kind of messing around with these ideas when I was writing Darwin's Radio and Darwin's Children and uh, realized that, that some of this anthropology I had was starting to really kind of bear fruit 100,000 years ago. What was the tangle like for human species together back then? And the whole idea of the uh, uh, um, Floresians, 
uh, Flores Islanders, being three feet tall. And anthropologists were having a very hard time with these fossils, making sense of them. And some of them were saying, well, they're a separate in kind of humanity. And I says, oh, this is a gang boss here. A three foot tall <laughs> guy is wonderful to work with. And so we'll just do that. And he'll be in charge of the gang. <laughs> So you made your own hobbits. I love it. <laughs> <laughs> and they even go on an adventure. That's right. We had a fellowship. Yep. There were, there were rings involved. <laughs> oh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> oh, no. What else oh, no. You even pasted this, didn't you? I don't know how much you're fans of, of anthropology, but the very large apes, Gigantopithecus, were actually more like orangutans, not gorillas. And so one of the characters in the novel is a Gigantopithecus with reddish fur. And 10 feet tall. I mean, you, you can't make this stuff up. These are amazing creatures. Amazing beings. The things you created were pretty amazing, to be fair. And this, where these character arc stories, like I said, um, I wanted to task uh, Chris, I brought them in. Uh, Halo Renegades is one of the most recent Halo books that came out by Kelly Gay. And she takes up the um, the story of Chocolate and 343. And he kind of evolves again and becomes a new character and becomes totally more relevant again. So... Again, I wouldn't be surprised if that's why you're seeing a resurgence of your own books, that people going back to see the origins of this character has now suddenly become so much more important. Uh, yeah, so Chloe will read it and I'll take a look at it and we'll we'll, uh, we'll have fun with it. But I, I appreciate that kind of expansion because that's what I was having fun doing. Again, there's also been some other stories that um, even wrap up Born Sellers' um, story again. So there's a few, there's one like uncredited story, which is kind of usual. I kind of hoping it was maybe you guys, I don't know. So they did like a Halo Fractures, which is like an anthology of little short stories. And the very last book in that talks about Born Seller's kind of, um, where he goes. It takes place on Theory's kind of, how he kind of dies. It's kind of, kind of wraps up his story. And there's another story called Promises to Keep by um, Christy Golden, who um, also kind of there's a child and it's a bit more of a story there so i just wanted to ask if you were aware of those things or just to... no but I, i'll have to look it up i'm i'm very yeah. pleased that they're taking a running with it yeah, i just looked that up i don't know i guess the the fracture story has growth through trial of change who's like the character i created for rebirth yeah i don't know i need to check that out because i like her and i didn't know that somebody else would actually pick her up and do something with her <laughs> yeah it's definitely worth going to check up so again that's an excellent excellent little segue there chloe into halo rebirth so can you tell me a little bit more about this because it was something i found very late I think it was Krista or Orin. It was one of you guys who actually told me about it because I'd never heard of it before because um, I'm on a little island and a little bubble on the <laughs> other side of the planet. So this was a unique little story that came out in a unique way. So can you talk to me about like where did this happen, how, when? Yeah, I don't really remember how it came to be exactly. I don't know. They, they tapped me to write that and he great co-wrote some of that with me. So uh, it's the story that's set like after the trilogy, after the halos are fired and the life workers have gathered up, you know, all the sentient beings in the universe and they're storing them on installation zero to keep them out of the path of the super weapon. So just sort of like about, you know, winding down the galaxy. Like they just killed all life in the galaxy. They're going to rebuild it eventually, but it's not going to be the same for thousands and thousands of years and everything's just going silent. And it's like a they're having basically this funeral for what was and celebrating what is to become. So I don't know. It's kind of a weird, like very mournful story when I was writing it for me. And and uh, she she did the, the the major story, and I went back and did a revision on it, and then had fun in the studio reading it out loud. And it's it's uh, Chloe has got you know got the chops to deliver that kind of tale, and also put the imagination into it. And also, I think like Halo is you know it's a game about I don't know everyone's like. Basically, Halo is literally a game about breaking circles, like both in the sense of it's <laughs> constantly and in the sense of that it's this galactic cycle of war and murder that's been going on for the entire history of the galaxy and just never stops. So Rebirth is kind of a nice, like, side vision of that world where everyone gets along and everyone can just, you know, sit by the bonfire and have a nice party of all different species. Yeah. Yay. It's not going to last, but it's nice to think about. Chloe set this up as a kind of a, a dessert phase for the books is a, a kind of a, a pleasant idol at the end of the books. And can you tell us about the format? Cause it was released quite unusually where it was an audio only. Um, yeah, that was that their could... decision. It was going to be like a promo for the books where you had to like get different copies of uh, the third book to get the codes that would unlock it online or something like that. Well, there was, yeah. I, this was a plan that I had thought of that, that if you put a secret uh, message into different editions of the novels, uh, and fans would find that they could go for unlocking gameplay. That turned out to be a little difficult to do, games being so expensive to make. 
So uh, what, what Tor decided was that they would turn this into a short story. And I think it ended up in some of the trade paperback editions as well. Yeah, I think so. Yeah, so, so when they put the trade paperbacks out, the stories were included. And uh, Chloe got credit for that. Uh, but also, when I was reading this, I was harking back to what they were talking about when they were reading the actual books. And the, uh, the uh, I'm going to forget the name of the voice actor who reads uh, the Halo uh, Forerunner books. But he was actually the voice of Guilty Spark. That was um, Tim Dabado? Yes, absolutely. And, and yeah. we met him at, uh, at uh, Emerald City Comic Con. And, and I suggested, you know, if you want to read those uh, books, there might, and I don't know if they actually did this or not, but if you want to read those books, when you take Chakas over into his transition to 343, you could go into your voice yeah. for the game. Yeah, they actually, they do that in the second book, yeah, because when he does the audio for that, I read it originally and then I got the audiobooks and gave it a listen. And at the moment he starts to sort of become 343, they do add the voice filters and modulation and, and he goes full Guilty Spark. It's fantastic to listen to. Yeah, and that's got to be a, a great thrill to catch on to that, you know, what's going on. It, it, that, that's uh, difficult to do in text. But the actors could certainly pull it off. Oh, no, I was going to say, I think if you'd come to it as an audiobook the first time around, I think he does such a good job with the narration the entire time that you never once put two and two together and realize who he is until the modulation kicks in. So it's it's a great reveal. I love that. I'm, I'm glad they were able to run with that. And obviously, when we have characters like this that have such unique and identifiable voices, it's hard not to hear them when you're reading the books. So it's always great to see things like that. I mean, I know Aaron's the big audio book guy. Um, what we call fake books, myself and Krista. But um, we love when we're reading the paperbacks. It's great to hear an identifiable voice like that. Well, again, it's the three four three people casting and doing all this stuff, and th this this is just reminds me that it's kind of the golden age of of multimedia and series and all that sort of thing in terms of movies and and uh, games. It, it's it's quite amazing what's going on in show business with all these venues we're kind of i think almost done i have a few questions from the community and any of the guys in the chat that want to ask anything else or sorry the guys on the call um, and then we'll kind of let you guys go so we had a question from redacted you kind of touched it already but you wanted to know how much of the forerunner trilogy came from the halo bible as opposed to being made by yourself when you were in the process of writing the book interesting question i the halo bible in some cases was not explicit about this and was going to be amended clearly so I did not spend a lot of time looking up things in the Halo Bible. I, I would go to the, the game creators and make sure they would allow me to change things. A lot of what's in the Halo Bible gets changed, the, the version that I have at any rate. I'm sure it's in constant flux. Um, given I, like, like you said, the expense around making a game, they need to be flexible on everything that's around that. Matt asks, um, what did it feel like having made one of the most important pieces of lore to date in the Halo universe? So this is just a bit of fan love, just to let you know. <laughs> My privilege to work with you guys. The fans were really, you know, the re response of the fans was supportive in, in such an amazing way. That that kind of kept us going through to the volume three. Yeah, I'm a fan. I used to be like, I used to be on Halo up on Org as a teenager. So like, feels <laughs> <laughs> so that must have been a great feeling, Chloe. Just being like, yeah, you know, I wrote this. You know, my dad wrote this. What are you going to do? You're going to argue with me? Yeah, and I can impress people. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, since Chloe was my, my reference here in a lot of these cases, she's responsible too. Young Animus asked them, you were at the helm of creating a story which by extension formed the Halo universe we love today. Did you ever think about the importance of surrendering the trilogy and what it would mean for fans seeing their fandom's literal creation? I guess he's kind of asking the concept of you wrote a trilogy about the creation of thing something we love so much. Did that ever dawn on you or did any of that kind of factor in? Well, it's, it shows the importance of imaginative freedom, that if you're working within a universe, you not only have to understand the personality of the original creators, such as they make it obvious, but you've got to kind of take a look at the, the settings and the, uh, the history that they are laying out, and you've got to fill it in. And that's what you do in a novel every time. In this case, I was given extraordinary freedom, which I really appreciate. But working on any of my notes, I just finished a book called The Unfinished Land. And revising that and going in and cutting out chapters and so on is, eh, it's it's never easy doing this sort of thing. But it is something that, that is, um, can, can leave a lasting impression. And I look back at all the science fiction writers, the fantasy writers over time, uh, including the Halo writers, and all that they've done to help create this. That comes out of 
the, the blood on the sweat of the brow as you're trying to figure these stories out. And it's never easy. And boy, you got to appreciate the creative aspects of this. When you get into the game creation, that's even more tense and sometimes uh, very expensive. And that's another level of creativity. And just working with these folks was a privilege. And very, very, very last question. One of the guys, Colin, asks, did you know about Cortana's um, heel turn when you were writing about the Forerunner books? Essentially, Cortana, I'm sure you're aware, Chloe, has com- changed completely and she's gotten access to um, the domain, which was another... I don't know if you guys created the domain, but that was another head scratcher of trying to wrap my brain around this concept. You created the domain, didn't you, Dad? I think so. Yeah, the domain was uh, an old science fiction idea, uh, highly amended for this usage, and and I thought it would be kind of cool to to break it in there. But yeah, to have Cortana, you know, a, a crazy AI having access to this wisdom is. is pretty- it's got to be great fun. I mean, I saw her heel turn coming since Halo 1, so I wasn't that surprised. Oh, really? So much more <laughs> was your influence, Chloe. <laughs> Did you break Cortana for us? Was that you? No, no that was them. That was their plan. Yeah, they, they. I didn't have much to do about that. So she's now the bad guy, which is um what we get to deal with now. So Presumably. that broke a lot of heart. Yeah, me too. That broke my heart. Yeah. <laughs> Even though you saw it coming? Said, yeah. Well, you know, it's oh. tragedy. Yeah, it is. Okay, what? Well, that's kind of it, really, guys. Unless um, Krista, Orn, Aaron, would you guys like to ask anything before we wrap up? I have a question. It's, uh, I think it's simple, but I just wanted to say that my favorite chapter in the whole trilogy is, I think, in Primordium when you describe essentially the creation of the flood and kind of how the parasite starts off and then manifests into this this intergalactic villain that we face throughout the games and the books. And you've mentioned throughout the show that you've, you've kind of taken different inspirations from other books. And I was wondering where might have some of the inspirations for how the flood uh, essentially is born came from, or if that was part of the foundations of what we already know about the flood from previous games. Well, well both. I think I'm harking back to blood music in my own brain but also a lot of science fiction that has to deal with biological evolution and changes and, uh, and you know, the, the challenge of... I, I actually don't specifically remember whether there was contribution from 343 in that aspect, but there might have been. Uh, but, you know, dealing with that kind of stuff is just stock and trade for science fiction writers. You, you got to come up with the incomprehensible and describe it. And I just think it's it was just described just so well. Um, and I, I think that was maybe one of the if there are many parts of the books that were hard to picture, uh, picture um, and visualize, I think that chapter was one that, at least for me, like just hands down, just uh, was able to really see it very uh, vividly and um, kind of how it manifested. It just all the pieces just started make, making sense, and it was just like, wow, this is just so interesting, considering of how. I mean, the flood develops it within the trilogy, but just also how much of an impact it makes throughout the uh, Halo universe. So I uh, just wanted to say that. Um, well, I appreciate that. And what you could do is you could take a look at Blood Music and let me know if, if in fact, I was influenced by that. <laughs> yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll check that out. Would you guys like to plug anything yourself? I know, Gray and Chloe, you're working on things. Is there anything you'd like to announce or say, go check this out, go this, go this? Oh, yeah, I actually just launched a blog um, like just last week. Like tabletop RPGs have already always been a passion of mine, so I'd launched this blog that's going to talk about like present a different non Dungeons and Dragons tabletop RPG every month and talk about what it is, why it's cool, and then also give you like a a starter scenario with pre made characters and then, like a campaign outline to go on from there. So you can, if you like it, you can just pick it up and run with it. So that's called Tabletop Infinities, and you can find it at a uh, tabletopinfinities.tumblr.com. Actually, there's definitely some overlap with their audiences there. I'd say you're you've a safe bet there advertising that here. Yeah, and I'm really excited about this. I just launched it, I don't know, the first uh, campaign outline. It's talking about Mage the Ascension, which is one of my favorite role-playing games. So it's like urban fantasy, kind of like Harry Potter versus the Matrix. And the campaign outline is a a source book for the entire magical community and history of the city of Seattle. So that's fun. (laughs) Oh, (laughs) It had to be saddled, didn't it? <laughs> <laughs> That's where Wizards of the Coast is. <laughs> That's where I am, so I know everything. Yeah, there's a lot of nerds up here. These, I don't know. Microsoft, you know, 343, Nintendo, Bungie. Yeah, all good people. And uh, my, my, I want to, if you're a real Halo fan of the military stuff, you might take a look at my trilogy, War Dogs, which is a, 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 th- a three-volume set of, of uh, Space War. Uh, in a very realistic tone, but with a lot of strange, strange stuff in it. So 
highly recommend War Dogs. And I'm working on, as I say right now, getting the last editorial plugs for a fantasy called The Unfinished Land, which basically covers everything we know and love. <laughs> That's a fine, fine plug. <laughs> Guys, thank you very much for taking the time to do this. I know it had been um, some some years since they were written, but um, greatly appreciated from, uh, from both of you. Yeah, you did great. Thank you. Thank you for joining us. Uh, please visit our website, halopodcastvolve.com. Also, Halo, uh, sorry, halopodcast.com. We also got that grab very recently. Come check out our community hub. We have an amazing website. It's so good. And does all hard work on it. We're in Discord. We're in Facebook. We're on Xbox Live. With that, I'm just going to say uh, evolved. Evolved. Evolved.